Back when I was still in high school, I used to work as a waiter at this super fancy restaurant on the corner of the common. I worked there for two Valentine's Days, and I've never understood why people didn't want to work them. Not the first year, anyway. Tips? They were awesome. So the next year, when I wasn't even on shift, it was real easy just to make a swap so I could get all those Valentine's tips. So, this guy comes in, good looking dude, but his girl was like Rihanna level hot. It was all eyes on her all night long. There was almost a fist fight in the back to decide who got to wait that table. Okay, maybe not a fist fight, but I personally witnessed two games of rock, paper, scissors, and they were low key intense. Anyway, the night goes on, we're working steadily, and the tips are just mounting up hour by hour. The dude was treating his girl to all kinds of bougie cocktails, insisting she have dessert, the most expensive entree, stuff like that. And the whole time we're just like, yes dude, boost that percentage, boost it. It wasn't my table so I couldn't keep track of the exact amount he dropped on her but I know it must have been like 5 hundy and change based on the pricing. But as they're wrapping up, I'm just waiting to see what kind of cut I'd be getting. When out of nowhere, a solo girl walks into the main dining area. She's not wearing anything fancy. She's looking like she'd actually been crying, and I remember watching her look around the dining room for a second or two before honing in on the dude and his Rihanna twin. You know when you just know something messed up is about to happen, and you can just feel the tension rising in the room before it suddenly explodes? I think everyone in the main dining room picked up on that as she powered over to the Rihanna girl and started screaming in her face. I remember watching our bartender, this big tattooed dude called Harley, walking over to her, getting ready to separate them or whatever. But before he got there, the crazy girl grabs one of the wine glasses from the table and just yeets it into the Rihanna girl's face. Harley goes from zero to a hundred trying to get over to stop it. This place was super fancy so it didn't have security or anything hanging around anywhere. In fact, we barely had any trouble at all. So when the situation exploded and diners were screaming and trying to get away, Harley was slowed down by all these people trying to get out of the dining room while he was trying to get in. Then in the meantime, the girl is just going ham on Rihanna with this broken wine glass before I actually come out of shock in time to act on it, she's picked up another glass and yeeted that one into her face too. Then get this, instead of actually helping his date, the guy actually just bailed out of the booth and ran out of the restaurant along with the rest of the customers. Total scumbag move, man, and something I'll never forget. Seconds later, me, Harley, and the rest of the waiting staff had basically body slammed the crazy girl away from Rihanna, well, she herself had slumped down under the table to get away from the attack. The cops eventually showed up, took the crazy girl away, and once the scene was safe and clear, the EMT showed up to treat the injured girl. I hadn't seen her at any point after the attack, not until the EMTs actually started treating her. And honestly, I couldn't even recognize her face. All around her eyes and nose, it just looked like ripped up red and... Her upper lip was almost cut all the way in half so you could see gums and teeth and stuff. It was one of the most horrific, upsetting things I'd ever seen. And every single Valentine's Day since, I'm reminded of that poor girl. And the horrific injuries she suffered at the hands of that psycho ex, or whoever she was. In the run-up to Valentine's Day of 2015, I found myself with a rather unfamiliar feeling. Loneliness. From 2010 onwards, I had been so focused on med school that I was content to barely have a social life and content to have a non-existent romantic life. I told myself that it could all wait until I was done with school and that frankly it would be irresponsible for me to curate distractions for myself while I was trying to reach the first milestone in my career goals. But after most of my high school friends had graduated and my social media feed began to swell with pictures of their dates, weddings, and pregnancy pictures, I began to feel like that I was really missing out. Call it social pressure or just plain loneliness, 
but I began to tell myself that it wouldn't be terrible if I just did a little casual dating, especially around the most romantic time of the year. So I did what most younger folks my age do and I downloaded one or two of the more popular dating apps. Being a woman and all, I didn't have any trouble getting matches. The trouble was actually finding a guy I liked after the opening conversation. So many of them seemed either too into it or clingy or way too cool and uninterested. The last thing I wanted was someone who'd badger me during intense periods of study, but I also didn't want to just be some player's option either. I know that sounds like I was asking for the impossible, and trust me, for a while, I thought I was being way too picky. But then came a guy that we'll call Ryan, and I only give him a fake name to protect the innocent. Ryan seemed charming, intelligent, and respectful, but he also took a while to answer my messages. I know that last part seems like a weird thing to count as a virtue, but I wanted a guy who had his own stuff going on. I liked the idea that he was sometimes just too busy to talk, and I guess that's because I saw a little of myself in him, but I digress. Out of all the guys I spoke to, Ryan was 100% the leading candidate. So there came a point where I straight up asked him if he had any Valentine's Day plans. I'm quick to add that I didn't ask him out. I just asked if he had plans, then waited for him to take the hint. Thankfully, he did, and he told me he knew of this cute little Portuguese bistro-type place that did some of the best seafood he'd ever had. Now, he didn't know this. I have the most boring, anglophone surname ever, but I'm actually a quarter Portuguese. So, I basically jumped on the offer and got super excited for the date. Valentine's Day fell on a Saturday that year, and I remember that because we ended up having to stew on a waiting list before our reservation was confirmed. Obviously, the will-we-won't-we drama had me even more excited than before, and when the time came to actually go meet him, I was feeling very romantic indeed. He looked amazing too. Three-piece suit, perfect hair, plus a little tactical stubble that accentuated his masculinity. Then, when he took off his jacket, hung it over the back of his chair, then rolled the sleeves of his white shirt up. My god. I thought I was going to explode with the desire right then and there. We talked, picked out some appetizers, and for about 45 minutes the date was going incredibly well. But then, I saw two people walk into the bistro that looked very, very out of place. Ryan had his back to the door so he didn't see them walk in, but I did. And right away, their state trooper uniform stuck out like a sore thumb. I'm sure you know the kind I'm talking about. The smoky bear hat with the super shiny tie clip thing. But as much as they initially grabbed my attention, I didn't want to be rude and interrupt Ryan in the middle of an anecdote. He definitely noticed me looking over his shoulder, but they were nothing but momentary glances, so not nearly enough for him to stop talking and looking around. Out of my peripheral vision, I see the cops being greeted by the restaurant's maitre d'. Then, I see the maitre d' pointing in our general direction. But again, nothing to be too concerned about. But then, the two cops started walking past a row of tables in our direction, and this is when I have to break eye contact and look up at them, because they stop right next to our table. Again, I've changed some of the details to protect the innocent. Sir? One of them said. Ryan looked up before the cop continued. Are you Ryan Smith of 111 Residential Street? Ryan responded in the affirmative, then asked if there was a problem. My heart and mind are both racing by this point, and in those few split seconds, I figured something terrible had happened to someone Ryan knew. That, or there had been like a break-in in his home or something. I never, ever would have guessed what the cop said next. Not in a million years. Then, as almost everyone in the restaurant is looking at us, wait and kitchen staff included, one of the cops says, Ryan Smith, I'm arresting you on suspicion of the murder of... Enter girl's name here. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can be used against you in a court of law. Etc, etc, etc. And I think my jaw must have been touching the tablecloth as I felt my face burning with embarrassment. Like I said, almost everyone in the bistro was looking at Ryan as the cops walked him out in cuffs. Then suddenly, once he was in the back of the cop car, 
they all started looking at me. I can safely say without a shadow of doubt that this was the single worst moment of my life so far. It was a cocktail of absolute horror for me. Everyone's eyes on me, coupled with the embarrassment of having my date arrested while assuming everyone was thinking, what kind of girl goes out with a murder suspect? Is she dumb? Is she in on it? It was just awful. And then it hit me that if he really had killed some poor girl, was I his next intended victim? Did I just avoid being murdered by a matter of minutes, hours, days, or weeks? Was he looking at me with those big warm brown eyes while thinking, she's so smart and pretty? Or was he looking at me all hungry because he couldn't wait to hurt me? I barely remember walking out of the bistro and the next day when I returned to pick my car up, I had to ask the maitre d' if I had walked out without paying. Turns out I hadn't actually paid, but the restaurant's owner overheard about the whole thing and told me that all the food and drink we'd consumed was on the house. It's a little acts of kindness like this which slowly restored my faith in humanity because, believe it, it had been badly shaken by the events of that Valentine's evening. I only really remember getting into the front seat of my car, calling my mom, then just ugly sobbing into the phone while she asked me, Are you okay? What happened, honey? Over and over again. Once I was finally able to get the words out, she told me not to drive home in such a state and to take a cab, and she was right. Even though I hadn't touched a drop of alcohol that evening, I was definitely in no fit state to drive. I suppose at that point I should just cut to the chase and tell you all what you want to know. And yes, Ryan was convicted of murdering the girl whose name I've chosen to admit. I was actually kind of hoping it was all just some horrible mistake, and that I hadn't seemed so dumb or naive to have gone on a date with an actual murderer. But nope. As the months went on, it progressed from an arrest, to a trial, to a full-on murder conviction. Ryan had gone on a date with some sweet, unsuspecting girl, taken her back to his apartment, then strangled her to death in the middle of being intimate. I remember my roommate saying that it might have been a kind of horrid accident, but it wasn't. Ryan had deliberately killed her, at a time when she literally couldn't have been more vulnerable. It might seem strange, but I did end up finding a kind of closure after the whole thing and I recommend this variety of cognitive behavioral therapy to anyone who suffered a similar trauma. I wrote Ryan a letter, or more accurately, I wrote a letter to a prisoner number and addressed it to the correctional facility he was being held at. I couldn't even bear to write his name, nor could I bring myself to write mine either. He'd know who I was, I was certain of it, and in the letter I told him in no uncertain terms that I hoped he would rot and burn forever. I told him a bunch of other things too, but those aren't fit enough to be reprinted anywhere remotely civilized. I don't know if he ever opened or read the letter, but the detective that I was in contact with informed me that it would most certainly be delivered. I hope he read my letter, and I hope it cut him up inside. I wanted him to feel as mortified and ashamed as I did in that bistro on that chilly Valentine's evening. I wanted him to read my words, and as he was reading... I wanted him to pray for the ground to just open up wide and swallow him whole, just as I did when all those people were looking at me with burning judgment in their eyes. I wanted so many things from that letter, but I only got one of them. Closure. Some of you might be wondering why I haven't named anyone or anyone in this account. It's for a number of reasons, but the primary one, I know this for certain, is that the family of the girl my date had murdered requested the privacy and space to grieve following his trial. Unfortunately, this wasn't respected by elements of the local and national media, and the family ended up suing one of the more unscrupulous publications regarding an article they posted online. If you ask me, it was righteous litigation, and although I wouldn't be all that worried about them suing me, given how closely connected I am with the case, I'd like to respect their wishes for privacy and anonymity. On top of that, I'd like you to respect my privacy and anonymity, at least until my prospective killer is released. Because then, I'll go public, truly public, and no matter how much my prospective killer tries to carve out a new life, a new identity, or a new existence, I'm determined to make sure that everyone knows what a monster 
He really is. I'd been dating a guy for a couple of months when he asked me to go over to his apartment for Valentine's Day. I dated a bunch of other fairly basic guys before him, dudes who didn't have a passion for anything beyond getting me into bed and I was sick to death of the steady diet of barstool sports and Bud Light. Nothing against barstool, but there's only so many episodes of one bite pizza a girl can handle before she wants to go permanently keto. Anyway, when I arrived over at his place, he welcomed me inside, and when I walked into his, like, main TV room, I saw how cool it actually was. The first thing I saw was how he had an actual projector mounted to his ceiling. Now, I'm kind of obsessed with movies. I thought that was one of the coolest things ever, but then I started to take note of the decor. The guy was a huge biology and horticulture nerd, so he had all these cool little plants and cacti everywhere. It made for a really cool vibe in the apartment, like it almost felt like you were half outside or something, which was just awesome considering we both lived by Queen Street West, so definitely not the greenest area of town. That, and he had a bunch of framed anatomical drawings of the human body around the walls of his TV room. If you don't know the kind I mean, you can Google them. They can be so dope, and to this day I want to get like an anatomical tattoo somewhere. I just don't know where yet. Anyway, when I told him I liked his digs, especially all the greenery, he asked me if I wanted to see something special. I told him, sure. But then when he led me towards his apartment's bathroom, I started to wonder if I had made a mistake. Just before he opened the door, he saw the nervous look on my face and started to laugh, reassuring me that it wasn't going to be anything too weird. And although I was still a little nervous, I told him to give me his best shot. Then when he opened the bathroom door, what I saw was nothing short of amazing. It was a kind of plant, that much was clear, with a thin green stalk that blossomed into a large scarlet flower, and sprouting out of the flower is what I can only describe as a large red spike, the same scarlet shade as the rest of the flower. I'd never seen anything like it in my life, and we both shared a little laugh when I told him it was by far the most interesting thing I'd ever seen in a boy's bathroom. He told me it was called a pygmy voodoo lily, and that they're extremely rare, and that it had cost more than his whole apartment set up. It had apparently come from a specialist breeder, and it was something he was very, very proud of. Not just because of how rare it was either, but because it took a lot of care and love to maintain, as he proceeded to explain to me. So if you'll excuse the diversion, the the thing I found kind of confusing was that he was keeping the flower in a kind of bell jar. He told me he didn't usually keep the lid over the thing, only when guests were coming over or whatever. Then he asked me if I wanted to know why he kept it in a jar and pulled the glass up just a little. All it took was a few steps forward and a breath through my nose and the stench hit me like a freight train. I physically recoiled. It was one of the most intensely disgusting things I'd ever smelled in my life. Ever leave raw chicken in the refrigerator too long and it's like the worst smell ever? Imagine that, but ten times worse. I'm a nurse too. I smell awful stuff on a nearly daily basis. But that smell had me almost gagging as I backed out of the bathroom and down the hall. When he finally came back into the TV room, where I was, he laughed as he said something like, See why I keep it in the bathroom? It was super gross, but don't get it twisted, I still thought the guy was really cool. He was 100% the most interesting guy I'd dated in literally years, and it was going to take way more than just a stinky plant for me to lose interest. Yet, unfortunately, that's exactly what happened over the next two hours or so. He ramped up the weird until I was actually terrified to be there. The first thing I noted was that the guy seemed to have hidden a few smaller jam jars behind some of his plants, then when I moved some of the leaves to check out what they were, I recoiled back in horror for the second time that evening. Hidden behind the potted plants were these three small jars. The first contained a toad or frog floating in some sort of preservative fluid. The second was another frog that had been completely and utterly skinned. It was so, so gross. 
like you could see all the muscles and sinew in its little legs and arms. The third jar was just containing a skeletal frog, but that wasn't nearly as messed up as seeing it skinned. Thinking about it now, at least he made an effort to hide the jars. It showed that he had some scrap of emotional intelligence, but since he was making dinner when I found them, which was the worst possible timing, it put me off eating entirely. Not like that was a huge problem. I was pretty nervous to try his cooking anyway, so it kind of suited me to just have an excuse. I prayed it wouldn't get any worse than that. I actually liked the guy for his personality too. He wasn't just a pretty face, he actually interested me. But then, like I said, he found one heck of a way to scare me off. So, as the evening went on and the wine kept flowing as they say, the questions got more and more personal. You gotta keep in mind that since I was basically on an empty stomach, I was way more buzzed than I'd usually be. So, when he asked me about having children in the future, not with him, just in general I guess, I was way more open to answer it than I might usually be. I told him that, yeah, I'd be down for having children, but obviously only in the right circumstances. This seemed to make him pretty happy, and then he starts waxing lyrical about how incredible the whole process of procreation is. I know I might have made that sound weird, but after all the wine, the way he talked about women having the superpower of reproduction, it was actually really poetic and beautiful. It seemed like he actually respected women, and definitely not in the nice guy, trademark type of way. Then after saying something like, there's nothing more beautiful than the creation of life, he asked me if I wanted to watch something. After he asked, he nodded up at his projector, suggesting we'd be watching whatever it was on that. I think I was so wrapped up in seeing the projector in action that I didn't even stop to think to ask what we'd be watching. Besides, I think it was implied that whatever it was would be a surprise, so I just let him do his thing while I watched him get set up. When he was done syncing up his laptop with the projector, the fact it was state-of-the-art was also super impressive to me. He turned off the lights and we sat together on the couch while the movie started rolling. As it started to play, it suddenly occurred to me that I was watching some kind of home video. It was high definition and it looked professionally filmed, but it was definitely not what I was expecting. In fact, I had no idea what I was expecting and I realized I should have been more insistent on finding out what I was going to be watching. The first thing I see is what looked a lot like a pregnant deer. It's lying on a bed of straw and it has what looked like an IV drip attached to one of its legs. This all made total sense to me at the time as I figured since the deer was pregnant it was being given medical attention and that it was being treated by some kind of wildlife vet possibly in some kind of national park, I don't know. I actually let out in an involuntary awe, but I spoke way, way too soon, because the video suddenly started to speed up, turning from a real-time video into a time-lapse of something. That involuntary awe was swiftly followed by an involuntary gasp, and a hand darted in front of the frame. You couldn't really see the razor blade, scalpel, or whatever it was that did the damage, but you sure saw the effects. In an instant, the deer's tummy opened right up and my half-buzzed brain thought it would be some kind of animal cesarean section. It was not. And oh my god, do I wish it had been because that would have been so much easier to bear. Instead of the deer's insides showing a little baby fawn or even just the silvery reddish pinkish insides of a healthy animal, the deer's internal organs were almost black with decay. It was only when I realized why his stomach was so swollen and before I could even say anything, the hand shot back into frame for a second, cutting away at some kind of membrane to reveal the biggest cluster of maggots that I'd ever seen in my life. There was like a solid, writhing, red and white ball of them, one that slowly disintegrated and spilled out of the deer's chest cavity as the footage moved forward at lightning speed. Like I said before, I'm a nurse and I've seen some pretty jacked up things on a daily basis, but seeing all those maggots was just way, way too much for me. I got up, grabbed my purse, and headed for the door. The guy was super apologetic and seemed to actually realize that he crossed a major red line. 
He didn't chase me, grab me, nothing like that. All he asked was that I stay if he turned off the projector. There was a moment where I actually considered it, but then I was suddenly hit by this instinct to just get out of there. I'd forgiven the weird dead frogs in the jar, I'd forgiven the plant that smelled of rotten meat, but I couldn't forgive the deer snuff film or whatever it was. It was all just too much. But before I left, I wanted to know what in God's name he was showing me. I turned, kind of drunk, purse in hand, and was just about to ask him what in God's name he was thinking, showing me something like that. I tried. I really did, but my eyes were suddenly drawn to the projector again. Instead of the white mass of squirming little bugs, I saw jet black spots crawling all over the dying deer. They were flying and moving so fast around the poor thing that they almost look like the kind of thing blemishes that you see on an old analog film. Almost all of the maggots had eaten their way into turning into fat, hairy corpse flies. But the thing that sticks with me, even today, is that the deer was still alive somehow. Its head was nodding up and down subtly, but it was happening. Then it hit me. The drip was in its leg because... Whoever had shot that film wanted it to be alive as those maggots ate their way through its insides. I don't even know how that would be possible. Sure, you could theoretically use antibiotics and maybe some kind of epinephrine derivative, I guess, to keep the poor little thing alive and awake, but who in God's name would have the expertise or motivation to do something like that? I had no idea how quickly that question would be answered. As I was heading towards his apartment door ranting and raving about how I was going to call the cops, what a sick piece of work he was, how if he ever called me again I'd have my brothers kick the life out of him. I can't remember exactly what he said, but it was all so much that I didn't say another word until I was safely inside a cab outside. He said something like, You have no idea how hard I worked on that project. If you had any idea the time and money I spent making it, the way that I must have looked at him had him shutting his mouth immediately. He knew that he just seriously incriminated himself, and it was something that he could probably go to prison for. Having sobered up pretty fast, I called the cops in the cab on the way home. You should have seen my Uber driver's eyes in the rear view as I talked. Whenever they weren't glued to the road, they just kept getting wider and wider as I progressed with my story. Then, by the time it came to dropping me off at my apartment, the guy was nice enough to ask if I wanted him to wait with me until the cops showed up. I appreciated the offer, but I declined it. And when the cops showed up to take a statement, I told them everything, all over again in much greater detail. I had to wait a few days to hear back from them, but when I did, they told me that although the guy had been arrested on suspicion of causing lethal harm to protected wildlife, he'd been released due to lack of evidence. In that time, he didn't text me, call me, show up at my apartment, nothing like that. He obviously wasn't a total psycho, and he was smart enough not to reach out to me, but I still think he had something seriously wrong with him. He had a seriously unhealthy fascination with the cycle of life and death, and the fact that he subjected an innocent animal to something so horrific is, in my eyes, totally unforgivable. That and pretty much all the evidence points to the idea that he would eventually escalate to hurting another human being. I don't want to be that girl in the Netflix documentary 20 years from now saying like, I had a chance to stop him and I didn't take it. I know there's an ongoing investigation taking place at the time of writing this, this is November of 2017 it happened, but I have literally no clue if he's going to go anywhere or not. Given how our interaction ended, the guy I was dating definitely had time to dispose of some evidence before the cops gave him a visit. I can only hope that they managed to dig through his hard drive or find some hidden USB stick or something. Anything that helps them either put him on a watch list or put him away in prison. But like I said, it always escalates. It always gets worse with people like that. And I'm just glad I had a chance to stop it before it was too late. Hi, let's read. I'll be honest, I haven't been a fan of yours for very long, but after watching a lot of your content over the past two weeks, I 
feel like this is the right place to attempt to tell my story. What's happening to me involves an ongoing police investigation, so please forgive me if I'm not forthright with the specific details. I'm not supposed to be talking about this, let alone contacting a large YouTube channel about it, so I hope you understand me omitting the names and places and people and organizations. Anyway, this is the story of my waking nightmare. Until about two weeks ago, I was employed as the head mental health counselor at a major university here in the UK. My job mostly consisted of coordinating sessions between counselors and students, although for two days a week I'd personally run sessions on a face-to-face -face basis with some of the more vulnerable students. Even in light of what's happened recently, I find my job extremely rewarding. Being a young person in a high-pressure environment such as university can take a very heavy toll on their mental health, and the fact that I've been able to guide so many of them to calmer waters is something I'll always be extremely grateful for. It's not always easy. My career has definitely had some ups and downs, but since hitting my 30s, I definitely feel like I've come into my stride. The fruit of this has obviously been my promotions, as I went from junior to senior advisor, and then a team leader in the space of just 18 months. I felt like I was running an effective, caring and professional operation, but beginning about three weeks ago, my entire life came crashing down around me in a truly devastating fashion. Like I said, I can't refer to anyone by name, so I'll use the name Amy to refer to the student in question. Amy was a first year who'd contacted our team in early February, saying she was having a hard time coping following a breakup back home. I'm sure you can imagine how many of those we get on a yearly basis, and the vast majority are first-year girls like Amy. Generally speaking, a little empathy and gentle advice go a long, long way with young women in such predicaments. And although we try not to lean on the plenty more fish in the sea or no guilt for the guiltless cliches, the counseling of such a problem tends to be relatively simple and concise. I had no idea how difficult and dangerous Amy's counseling would be, but when one of my junior team members approached me with their own predicament, I was only too happy to assist them. It is, after all, in my very job description that if a junior member of the counseling team is having trouble with a student, I step in to apply my experience and expertise. And when a junior team member was struggling with Amy, I relished the opportunity to build trust, apply leadership, and lessen their workload. But that proved to be one of the biggest mistakes of my life so far. My first session with Amy was fairly productive. We talked about her relationship, what it meant to her, and why it was difficult to move on from. I could understand why my colleague had such a hard time with her, as she was extremely emotional and very highly strung. My initial suspicion was that she was suffering from GAD, a general anxiety disorder. But before recommending any kind of formal psychiatrist appointment, which usually leads to prescription medication, I thought it would be best if we had one or two more sessions to see if we can resolve things in a healthy, non-prescription manner. Again, this was a huge, huge mistake. By the time the second session was over, I would identified a few key issues that I believed Amy could work on in her own time. The first was that she seemed to absolve herself of any kind of personal responsibility, be it in her own now defunct relationship or in her home life. In short, every problem in her life was caused by someone else, even if she had to grasp for some abstract reason with which she could lay the blame. The second was that she refused to even entertain the idea that she might be able to identify any kind of solution on her own. In a lot of cases, answers are much more easily obtained within oneself, we generally don't need a library of self-help books or podcasts if we're brutally and sincerely honest with ourselves. This doesn't always mean the person themselves are at fault. For example, it might be that one has a detrimental person in their life who they refuse to leave behind. All you need is the self-awareness to identify that person, habit or behavior, than the bravery to deal with them. Since Amy seemed incapable of such introspection, I knew it was something that I'd have to bring up with her, and fast if we wanted to make quick progress. So for our third session, which just so happened to fall on the day after Valentine's Day, I put forward a few of my uncomfortable observations. Now as you can imagine, 
it's not nearly as simple as just telling the person you have issues. This might sound obvious, but the idea with counseling is to actually counsel, not pass judgment, give direct treatment suggestions, or tell anyone what to do. The trick is to allow a person to come to a healthy conclusion on their own. This is just as true of counseling as it is of child rearing. A person must learn to be good voluntarily, not under duress. So, the way I usually approach something like that is to simply ask questions. Do you think you could do X, or can you see yourself doing Y? That sort of thing. Simply worded, polite questions that provoke spontaneous thoughts and introspection. But when I put it to Amy that some of her problems might be of her own creation and that her inability to settle on a healthy coping mechanism was impeding any progress, she didn't take it very well at all. In fact, she not only saw zero merit to my polite suggestion, she took it as a direct, unsheathed insult. I know for a fact, with it being near Valentine's Day, her sense of loss was infinitely stronger than it was before but it was still dismayingly surprising when Amy burst into tears, declaring that her visits to the university's counseling team had been counterproductive and a complete waste of time. Then, to my increasing concern, she seemed to enter a sharp downward spiral of negativity right there before my eyes. I tried my best to calm her down, told her to try the psychological breath technique, but none of it seemed to work. And suddenly... A mild jolt of horror went through me as she spat out the words of taking her own life. Despite the shock of hearing those terms thrown around so casually, I believe I'm fairly adept at dealing with threats of self-harm and lo and behold, after a few careful minutes of sub-crisis management, Amy regained a degree of composure. Once her breathing was under control, she asked if she could use the office's restroom. Naturally, I showed her into the small restroom out in the common area, then told her she could return to my office whenever she was ready to continue the session. As I'm waiting for her, five minutes passes, then ten minutes passes, then at fifteen, I actually thought she might have just walked out of the counseling office, having abandoned the session entirely. But the moment I walked out, Becky, the counseling office's secretary and also not her real name, shot me this puzzled look. She didn't leave the toilet, did she? I asked her. Becky just shook her head, and in that instant, the flash of fear I'd felt before boiled up into full-blown terror. I started banging on the door, shouting Amy's name, and telling her if she didn't open the door, I'd call the fire brigade, paramedics, and anyone who could stop her from hurting herself. I rattled the doorknob, basically started punching the door, but no one said a word on the other side and it gradually dawned on me that if I wanted to actually save this girl's life, I'd have to kick the door down myself. I'd never done anything like that in my life, and at five foot eight and nine and a half stone in weight, I don't think I'd actually be able to do it. Time and time again, I sent myself crashing into the solid oak, but it didn't so much as budge. At one point, I looked around to see Becky looking absolutely terrified, bone in hand, indicating she was already contacting emergency services. In the end, I didn't need to. The door swung open on its own, and when I saw the state Amy was in on the other side, I was almost propelled backwards in complete and utter astonishment. Amy was covered in blood. There was a large cut on her upper lip, one which had poured blood down her chin, neck, and chest. There was also visible bruising on her wrists and forearms, as well as a trickle of blood edging down from her hairline onto her eyebrows. I'm ashamed to say that the sight came with a sick sense of relief knowing that she'd just been hurting herself as opposed to actually taking her own life. I knew she was in a volatile state, I knew she was suffering a deep emotional pain, but I never, ever expected to hear the words that came out of her mouth. Ow! Stop hitting me! Please, I'm sorry. Ouch. Ow. As she screamed, I watched in absolute horror as Amy grabbed herself by the fleshy part of her forearm and began to squeeze. I instinctively backed off, hands in the air, showing our similarly terrified secretary that I hadn't laid a finger on her. We both watched as Amy proceeded to throw herself into the heavy oak door, 
head first, and the impact was so forceful that Becky actually let out a cry of distress. She did it again, and again, and again, until I was forced to step in to physically restrain her. When I did so, she sunk her teeth into my arm so hard that I too let out a scream, and as I let her go, she tumbled into the arms of Becky and began weeping uncontrollably. I remember looking down at my arm and seeing the little flecks of blood that were forming in the indentations her teeth had left. Then, once Becky had assured me that the police were on their way, standing operating procedure in the event of a violent episode of self-harm, I retreated to my office to remove myself from the situation. It was a horrific day for me, without a doubt one of the worst in my practicing career, but again, I had no idea how bad things would really get. When the two uniform officers showed up at our offices, I felt this brief sensation of relief before I heard Amy giving her very distorted version of events. Not only did she claim that I'd attacked her in the office restroom, but she also claimed I'd violated her in the most violent manner possible. I was stunned into silence, and if it wasn't for Becky giving her side of the story, I think I'd have been under arrest right there and then. One of the officers had a very intense look about them as they quizzed me on my bite marks and like I said, if it hadn't been for Becky clarifying what had happened, I'd have been in a lot of trouble much sooner. As you can probably guess, the office restrooms aren't covered by cameras and for obvious reasons, the camera in the reception area doesn't face them either. This proved a huge problem later on, but at the time, Becky's account was all I thought necessary. That was Monday, February 15th, the day after Valentine's Day. On Tuesday, I was down at the city's central police station once again giving my version of events. The officer I spoke to seemed like he was on my side and that he understood Amy to be a very disturbed young woman, and for a while I think that was actually the case. On the Wednesday, I received a call telling me that there would be no further criminal investigation for the foreseeable future and that the investigating officers understood what had actually happened. I was also asked if I wanted to press charges against Amy for biting me, and as much as I declined on compassionate grounds, I was told the university was probably going to exclude her for making a false accusation, not to mention damaging university property. That decision was simply out of my hands, and although it's not strictly how I'd have handled it, I appreciated their position. I believe that's what forced Amy's hand and motivated her to do what she did next, because her next move was to go public. The first I heard of it was when a colleague called me at about 1 o'clock on the Friday morning asking me if I had a Twitter account. I didn't, and I still don't, but that didn't mean I wasn't able to view the relevant tweets, tweets that featured a hashtag consisting of hashtag arrest and then my name next to it. There were literally hundreds of those tweets, maybe even thousands of them, many from students at our university but also hundreds from people who had just jumped on the vindictive bandwagon. It was definitely disturbing to see, and I'd be lying if I said it didn't affect my sleep that night, but I honestly didn't understand the true implications of such a misinformation campaign until the coming weekend. By that time, there had already been a miniature protest outside of the counseling offices and with an incredible amount of ire directed at me, I tried and failed to enter. The result was that the university's administration had sent me home early, then called later in the evening promising me paid leave until the turmoil could be smoothed over. That was the first nail in my coffin. To the people in the know, it was standard procedure, nothing more than a way of protecting a valued member of the faculty. But to the Twitter mob... That was the surest sign of guilt so far. I hadn't been given paid leave to manage my stress. I'd been suspended pending an arrest and a eventual guilty verdict. The tipping point was when Amy directed the mob at our secretary, Becky, whose sole testimony had kept me from being arrested. I kept in touch with her, and although she initially promised to stick by me, I knew they got into her when she stopped answering my calls and texts. I don't know exactly how they threatened her or if the mob had found something to dangle over her head, but from what I heard, she spontaneously went to the police to change her official statement. After that, the case was reopened, and I was officially arrested for assault and 
I honestly can't even bring myself to type it here. It's the part that really turned a horrific, false accusation into the stuff of living nightmares. I'm simply incapable of that aspect of the crime, and I can't even get into the headspace of someone that would be psychologically able to do something like that. But one by one, my colleagues, my friends, even members of close family, I felt their opinions of me shift as the accusations began to mount, not just from Amy, but other members of the student body, and even a few local girls who I'd never even been in the same room with. When I tried to contact Becky again, when I tried to beg her to tell the truth about what happened that day, I was told that if I did it again, it would constitute witness intimidation. And that's where I'm up to. It's been almost a whole year and I still don't know whether this is actually going to trial or not. My solicitors think that once the mob's energy is properly died down and Becky is ready to come forward with the truth, then I'll be able to put this horrible chapter of my life behind me. I hope one day the truth of the matter will actually be re-established, but honestly, I don't know if that day will ever come. There's obviously the complete lack of DNA evidence, and that's putting it as uncrude a way as possible, but I still have my doubts. And the way people have shown a complete lack of regard for evidence in due process has been one of the most terrifying and depressing aspects of my experience so far. I know in my heart of hearts that even if you actually read this mess of a story to your followers, some of them will just decide I'm a liar. They'll decide that Amy's side of the story is weak and incoherent as it is is the actual truth. And that, to me anyway, is far more terrifying than any ghosts, monsters, or magic. I recently watched your Places with Scary Backstories video and most of it helped keep my mind off this whole torrid affair. But one story brought me right back to reality. The one about the Salem witch trials. Hundreds of years later, and the mob is still hunting witches. They still want to watch them burn. Just as the mob wants to watch me burn too. I remember matching with this girl around Valentine's Day a few years ago. She seemed super nice and interesting, but then a few days before we were due to meet, she started telling me about the story of St. Valentine. Apparently, this guy was one of these early Christian martyrs and got his head cut off because he wouldn't cancel Jesus or whatever. Then, when he gets to heaven, he, like, was carrying his own head. And Jesus is super stoked because Valentine presented his own severed head to him as like a welcome gift or whatever. I mean, actually picture that for a second. It's creepy, right? So, when this girl started ranting about how that was the most beautiful thing she'd ever heard, and that she'd love to have a guy show her that kind of affection, hmm. She didn't just mention this once either. She mentioned it like every time I brought up Valentine's Day. The final straw was her sending me this picture, along with the question, would you wear flowers in your hair like this for me? I just bit the bullet and unmatched her, because as pretty as she was, she had thrown up way too many red flags. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm Eastern Standard Time. And if you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.